We're working our way through the Ten Commandments as a church, knowing that the Bible says that we must love the Lord our God, and that we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. We must love God and neighbor. And that the law is actually summed up by these commands to love. The commandments define love. So it's necessary to not think of them as random, arbitrary rules, but as ways to love. They come to us in two tables, our love for God in the first four commandments, our love for neighbor in the latter six. We are in the second table, discovering our love for neighbor. The first says, honor your father and mother, the fifth commandment, and establishing authority, the commandment right after that protects life. We talked last week about how the commandment to not murder preserves image bearers and keeps them alive so that we can represent God in the world as a life giver bearing his image. Very special, very sacred. Today, we're looking at the commandment to not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. The commandment protects the sanctity of marriage and family, and it actually is interpreted to expand quite broadly, not merely adultery, but all sexual immorality, sexual expression outside the confines of biblical marriage. So today we need to define and talk about biblical marriage. Here's an outline in your bulletin. I'm going to overwhelm the note takers. I'll apologize in advance. I'm sorry. There's not enough room on there. But I'm making you kind of a handout so you can take it with you if you want to. Hopefully you can relax and listen. It'll be lovely. First, Christian singleness, marriage, and family reflect God. Christian singleness, marriage, and family reflect God. Now, how, how does that work, Pastor Dan? How? How do these states of living reflect God. Well, the first thing that we can note biblically is that human beings are created in the image of God, but God creates us in two phases. The man is created alone. He's in solitude. The man is created in solitude. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image, In the image of God, he created him. The Christian religion teaches us that God is one. We're one of the great monotheistic religions, one God. And we can see in the first stage of the creation of humans, one human, reflecting the one God. But we find out that this is not adequate that the divine image cannot rest solely on this one person because we learn through Holy Scripture that God is a holy trinity, three distinct persons eternally existing in the one God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And yet, mysteriously, there are not three gods but one God. The persons are not parts of God or modes of God or manifestations of God. They are persons. In a communion of persons. So that this God is a trinity, a tri-unity, a diversity of persons, and a unity of God. So then when we look at the human family and consider the second stage of the way humans are created, we see this diversity and unity immediately, actually. Look at 126. Then God said, let us, plural pronoun, us, make man in our image, after our likeness. So the plurality of the communion of persons is about to be expressed in the plurality of human beings. This diversity is in the next Verse, so God created man in his own image. Remember, we just talked about solitude. Now look at 
diversity and unity. In the image of God, he created him male and female, two diverse ways of being human. He created them. Text goes on to give us information about the, how the man and the woman will unite in their diversity into a very special union, the union of marriage. And in this human family, we will get a reflection of, an image, a glimpse of the triune God. Genesis 2, 18 says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper for him. First, down in verse 22 says this, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. I love this text. I love this text because between those two verses, there's a parade of animals coming before Adam for him to give them names. A parade of difference. All these animals are not like me. They all have partners, but I don't. How would you feel you're naming all the animals? You're single. And then all of a sudden, God does this, creates a partner, one who is like you. Of course, of course, he bursts into song. And his joy is just like the joy of a groom who stands in front and his, sees his bride approaching down the altar, being given in a, like a play depicting this Drama from Genesis as the woman is presented to the man. Brought her to the man and he explodes into song. I haven't had any of the grooms that I've married sort of burst forth in poetry or in music right here, but maybe you want to take notes. I mean, some of you are engaged. (laughs) Then the man said, this at last. I love that. Remember the parade of animals? At last! (laughs) Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore marriage. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The diverse union, the one flesh mystery is reflective of the trinity of persons in the one God. But it doesn't end there because in the biblical story, the communion of persons bursts forth in creation, an overflow of divine love. And we see this, this reflected too in, the, in this mysterious union between husband and wife. We find out that it's procreative that this union is fruitful, that more divine image bearers will issue forth from this total donation of husband and wife to each other. Children, eternal beings coming forth from their union and we get to participate and even image the creator as we participate in procreation. Genesis 1.28 says this, and God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. I want my image bearers all over this globe, mediating blessing to the nations. It's beautiful. It's awesome. It can be hard for us in this modern era to see the linkage between marriage and procreation. But it is definitely within the text. So this principle of diversity and unity in God, diversity and union and and unity in the human family that is that is procreative is a central lane of truth. The reality of the way that God has made the universe. And you've seen me, some of you have been here before. I put up slides with the middle way, right? The road between two ditches. And with this too, we can see. Ditches on the sides of the road related to the nature of marriage and how the nature of marriage in humans sustains the Trinitarian reflection of diversity in unity. 
And as we get into the ditches, we can see descriptions of sexual behavior that are out of bounds, that are in the ditches. So you can look at it this way. Your central lane, the way of reality and truth and goodness and beauty, diversity and unity in the The heterosexual union that is fruitful, bearing children, usually if it is God's will. And yet the error of too much sameness and the dead union that comes from this. Or too much diversity and the dead union which proceeds from this. And the Bible prescribes these acts and relationships with stiff stiff penalties. But besides the the nature of marriage depicting something about the nature of God himself, we can also learn something about the covenant-keeping relationship with God and humans. Marriage is a covenant. It's a covenant. This is a biblical idea. I'll show you one text. There are several that support this idea. Malachi chapter 2, beginning in verse 14 The Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. The Lord makes it, it is a covenant. Text goes on to say, did he, God, not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? Staggering thought. And the tie again to procreation. And what was the one God seeking godly offspring. So we saw a slide about the the way of truth between two ditches regarding the nature of marriage. I'm going to show you another one now with distortions or problems in the covenant, the covenant of marriage. Marriage covenant is to be lifelong, monogamous, and the errors of wrong covenant lead to problems. Other ditch, other types of problems, no covenant at all, more problems. Brokenness, terrible social problems. And this is our reality. Writers have described the fact that we're living in a time of a moral crisis, a moral convulsion, as we redefine things that have been standards for centuries, millennia. And as Christians, we feel the pressure. And every person in this room is affected by this. Every single person. And it's on the rise, not on the decline. As marriage itself bends and cracks under the strain and the pressure. Close to half of children are now born out of wedlock. Denied the privileged reality of growing up with a committed mother and father in the home. So, my friends, we the church have the truth. We get to lead. There will be pressure. It will be hard. There will be sufferings. But we must boldly lead with grace and tact and truth. Christian singleness, marriage, and family reflect not only God, but our second point this morning, Christian singleness, marriage, and family reflect the gospel. It reflects the gospel itself. And we can see this from the Old Testament when we consider God and Israel. I've shown you this text before, Isaiah 54, verse 5, so, be- so beautifully states, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. You can look up Ezekiel chapter 16 as the prophet expands on this metaphor for a long time. Not only exulting in the beauty of God's covenant love, but the tragedy, the tragedy of idolatry and faithlessness being attributed and used words like prostitution and adultery. Christian singleness and family reflect the gospel, God's redemptive covenant with his people. Not only in the Old Testament, but the theme is expanded upon in the New and applied to Christ the groom. The most famous and central text is in Ephesians 5. But our Lord in his Gospels refers to himself 
in several places as the bridegroom. Here, Paul, writing in Ephesians 5, the marital metaphor. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. This is enacted in our wedding ceremony. As the bride comes approaching, we talked about how that was going on in the Garden of Eden. Now you have it with Christ in the church, arrayed in a beautiful dress, spotless, their wedding clothes, presented to Christ the groom as a picture of redeeming love. Without blemish, therefore a man, Paul's quoting Genesis, marital language, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So we can see that this marital imagery represents the story of redemption, the Old Testament, the New Testament. And even the notion of procreation is here if we think about what it means to have disciples. Jesus says, if you want to live with him, you must be born again. In the union between the bride, the church, and the groom, Christ is a fruitful union, issuing forth in generation after generation of those who have been born again, sons and daughters. In this way, the church is a kind of bride, but now a mother. Christ, a type of father in this idea. So if you can think about God in Genesis say, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, we have Christ the groom saying something similar in his great commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Isn't that beautiful? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age, Christ the groom in a fruitful union with the bride, the church, issuing forth in sons and daughters of God. Christian singleness, marriage, and family reflect the gospel. Some applications. Some applications. First, first, we must honor singleness. You say, Pastor Dan, I don't really understand why you keep including singleness on a commandment that says you shall not commit adultery. And don't you know, Pastor Dan, with all this teaching about marriage and children, you're ostracizing single folks, you're ostracizing the childless. The church needs a more inclusive message so that people don't feel like second-class citizens. Amen. Amen. So before really we talk too much about marriage, we need to talk about what singleness is. Already we've said that in our singleness we reflect the solitude of God. The one God is reflected even in our bodies, single people. But as single people, as citizens of the household of faith, you're also entering into a type of marriage with the church. How can the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, St. Paul, a single man, call himself a father to his dear son, Timothy. He's not related to Timothy by blood. But the Apostle Paul has a type of paternity as he's united with Christ and has spiritual disciples. It's tremendously beautiful. Single folks can look up a generation and see their mothers and fathers in the faith and honor their parents and this spousal household of faith that is fruitful. Perhaps your spouse has, is deceased. How is there a place here for you? As you engage in the community of faith and adopt spiritual children, you too have a type of maternity or paternity. As you engage in this union with Christ, a fruitful union the household of faith. We have to honor singleness. We can't get into a, a, a place where it's the married folks against the single folks. 
We have to help care and support and love one another together. For we need single folks to operate chastely to support marriage. And we need married folks to operate in a beautiful and caring way to help those who are in the single state. So we must honor singleness It's a holy vocation. Paul says this, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man or woman is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. There's a type of union with Christ for singleness, which we honor and include. Secondly, this teaching tells us to honor marriage, doesn't it? And this Comes straight out of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. We must honor marriage as an institution. We must honor marriage in living in faithfulness to our covenants. We must honor marriage. Third, This commandment teaches us to flee sexual immorality because it's broader, as I said, than mere adultery. It includes all sexual sin outside the confines of biblical marriage. We must flee from sexual immorality, and that's hard, difficult. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin is... Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. It's difficult. We need to help each other as brothers and sisters in Christ to fight temptation and to flee from sexual immorality. Next, don't approve. Don't approve. What does this one mean? We're under a lot of cultural pressure, cultural pressure to redefine things, to approve of things. But the Bible teaches us that we must not approve these things. In Romans 1, after Paul gives a pretty devastating list of wicked behaviors, he says, though they, the wicked, know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So there isn't sort of a neutral place to stand. You have to stand with the Lord on these things. Rosaria Butterfield's an important voice in this conversation. She talked how important it was for her that she was loved and accepted by a pastor who was evangelizing her but that he never approved of her lifestyle. There's a difference between accepting and loving a person without approving or agreeing with them as they redefine things and expect you to follow suit. Rosaria says, acceptance does not mean approval. Approval is to add a blessing. Approval itself is a sin. Don't approve. And the last thing that we have to say is that we must begin anew. And we must begin anew with compassion because all of us have things in our lives that we're not proud of. And this area of our life is attacked because it's holy. And so it's fraught with all kinds of brokenness and difficulty that affects every single one of us. But the glorious gospel of grace says that there's no such thing as someone who is used up and thrown out. The gospel of Jesus Christ says that there are new beginnings. The gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us that the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. That the forgiveness that is ours takes our sin and casts it into an ocean of forgetfulness. That he removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. Begin anew. Begin anew. 
Paul preaches with so much hope in 1 Corinthians. Gives again a, a long list of bad things, broken things. And then he says this, such beautiful, beautiful language. And such were, past tense, some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In repentance, when we're walking with the Lord, God looks at us and he sees his son. <laughs> it's a staggering thought. Arrayed in his righteous robes, cleansed by the blood of the lamb. This is our story. This is what we preach. This is what we sing to each other. Begin anew. May it mean repentance and community and a long uphill road of cross-bearing, but Jesus says, that's what it is. That's what it is. Don't bury it in the fine print. <laughs> That's what it is. And because of this, church, we have to have the right tone in this conversation. Tone of compassion and care, respect, but also of firmness and clarity and truth. Difficult cultural moment. As I said, a moral convulsion. But our Lord says that if we follow these, his commandments, as the Holy Spirit writes them in our heart, and as we live this out, we will shine like a city on a hill. We'll be salt and light. And people will ask you, what's the reason for the hope that you profess? And you'll have an opportunity to share the good news. So what have we seen? We've seen the Christian singleness in marriage and family give us a glimpse of God in his oneness, in his triunity, and in his abundant creativity. And we've also seen that Christian singleness, marriage, and family depict the gospel in Christ's covenant relationship with his bride, the church, which is also a fruitful union issuing in disciples. And there's a place, my friends, for everyone at his table let us pray. Father in heaven, you've been so generous and kind. Thank you for allow, allowing us to be your ambassadors. Forgive us for when we fall short and give us the power by the gospel and the Holy Spirit to walk with you always in the robes of Christ. It's in his strong name we pray and by the Spirit. Amen. Let us respond in song.